I can uh, share the screen if you want, uh, but I can do it also later. Okay, uh, welcome uh, to Informatics Institute uh, Spring Seminars. Today we are hosting Associate Professor Dr. Jehangir Tezjan. I think most of you know him, but uh, let me introduce him very briefly. He is the head of Department of Cybersecurity at our institute and the director of Cybersecurity Center uh, at uh, Middle East Technical University. Before joining our institute in 2019, he was a researcher at various places such as Bochum in Germany and Lausanne in Switzerland. So today he will be talking about blockchain technology, NFT, Web3 and Metaverse. So the screen is yours, Jihan Yerja. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, today I'm going to talk about many uh, different technologies. So these are some are decent technologies. So I actually like kind of all of them, but after briefly uh, describing what they are, I will talk about misconceptions and what possible challenges. So it might appear that I will be uh, saying bad things about them, but my here aim is to show what can go wrong and what are the misconceptions. So uh, I will start with blockchain technology. So with the invention of Bitcoin in 2008, uh, this introduces a new technology that is blockchain. This, there's also a misconception here. People think that there was there were blockchains and Bitcoin just uh, appeared years later. But actually, everything started after the invention of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was invented around 2008. But of course, in the first week of 2009, it uh, started functioning as the first block. So blockchain is actually a digital ledger that stores transactions in blocks. And blocks are uh, connected to each other using cryptographic hash functions. So transactions are stored in blocks and their integrity is provided by cryptographic hash functions. Each block is connected to the previous one via, again, cryptographic hash functions, creating a secure chain of information that is tamper evident. Some people say that uh, blockchain data cannot be changed. Actually, it can be changed, but once it has changed, you can easily detect it. That is why we say it actually tamper evident. And each transaction is signed by a digital signature algorithm. So the italic parts are actually where we have cryptographic algorithms. So uh, cryptographic hash functions are used for integrity and digital signature algorithms are used for uh, authentication. Blockchains are stored across, across a distributed network of servers, each continually exchanging, storing, and updating the ledger. So you have the ledger in, in a distributed way. Everybody is keeping the same ledger. So they are synchronizing it all the time by exchanging information. So this is the main idea behind decentralized uh, network, let's say. So this allows the information to be decentralized and unable to be corrupted by a single user. So with this basic definition, let me try to explain it with a picture using the Bitcoin block structure. So at a block, what happens is as follows. You hear transactions, generally uh, shortened as TX. So uh, people announce their transactions. If you want to send Bitcoin to somebody or in a different blockchain, if you want to have a transaction, actually you announce it to the network. So everybody actually keeping the list of these uh, transactions. And this part actually is the block data, but you also have a block header. So you have to uh, somehow keep this information in a very sh shortened way in the header. This is what you do. You apply a cryptographic hash function. So cryptographic hash functions are uh, deterministic algorithms, which can take variable length input, but provides fixed length output. So for instance, if you use SHA-256, all of these hashes are 256 bits or 32 bytes. So here, uh, Bitcoin uh, performs something different. So they actually construct a Merkle tree. So hashes in pair are also hashed, going upwards to reach a root. And this root actually included in the header. So this way, whenever somebody claims that a transaction is in this block, they have to prove that the hashes 
correspond to the Mercury. This is how we uh, provide the actual the integrity of a blockchain. Okay, so the header is also hashed, and the hash of this header is included in the following block. So there, here there is a, a huge challenge because since everybody is listening to these transactions and recording them to their ledger, in other words, the blockchain. Uh, we have to be sure that everybody is keeping the same ledger, right? So somebody can, a malicious person can announce a transaction one saying that uh, they are transferring Bitcoin to some person A, but they can also announce that they are transferring the same Bitcoin to person B at the same time. So half of the network nodes can include this transaction here, but maybe the remaining half will not be include this transaction. So idea is as follows, we have to slow this process so that everybody is keeping the same uh, ledger. So one way of doing is to, you know, uh, instead of uh, accepting any hash here, which is the hash of this block, let's make it difficult and say that the hash has to start, for instance, with 50 zeros. The probability of this happening is the same as, you know, flipping a coin 50 times and seeing tails in a consecutive 50 times. So this way you actually uh, slow it down. In Bitcoin, the slow down difficulty is 10 minutes. So what happens is as follows. A, a node hears these transactions, calculate this hash and perform this hash operation. It doesn't provide uh, that a hash value that started at 50 zeros, so you update the nodes. And actually this nodes well is 32 bits, so you try everything here, it doesn't work. So you go back to transactions and modify them. So the first transaction is actually a special transaction, which actually give, awards you some Bitcoin. So this way you actually modify it and do the same process again and again and until you find the uh, acceptable hash. And this way you everybody agrees once you solve this problem, Everybody now agrees that this is the block 11 and you move on to block 12. So at this uh, transaction, you are awarding yourself Bitcoin because you performed a lot of computations and you prove that you really work. So this is why you are awarded. So this process actually consumes a lot of electricity, right? So for this reason, uh, these cryptocurrencies are always uh, uh, kind of uh, said that maybe we should find another solution. As you can see, the estimated electricity consumption of Bitcoin yearly is, reaches 200 terawatts per year around here, but currently it is uh, going down. So a similar thing happens with Ethereum. So as you can see, at some point it reached around 80 uh, terawatts per uh, year. So we are using these hash puzzles to, uh, you know, prevent double spending. So the security comes from here. And if you look at the electricity consumption of countries, for instance, we are using close to 300 terawatt hour, but Bitcoin at some point reached 202. So people are not happy with this. But similar thing happens also in gold mining. You have to uh, use electricity. And uh, the thing is that this doesn't have to be like this anyway. For instance, uh, this might look like a huge number. It is higher than most of the annual electricity consumption of many uh, European countries. But even in USA, the uh, devices that are connected to the, uh, you know, that are plugged in but are not used actually uh, consumes more electricity than the Bitcoin mining. But the thing is that this doesn't have to be like this. As you have seen in the graph, it was uh, slowing down. This depends how many miners are around and it depends on their hardware. But if you change the uh, consensus algorithm here, so instead of finding a, a hash value that is smaller than something, you can uh, do something else. And Ethereum actually is planning to do it. They are trying to move on to proof of stake. So if they do it, and it is expected to be in August 2022, but this process delayed many years, so maybe it might be delayed a few more months here. But once you do it, it will you know, consume less than one terawatt hour. 
So uh, this is not the main uh, problem with the cryptocurrencies, but the misconceptions and challenges in this area are somewhat different. Um, one of the main misconceptions is that since this is called cryptocurrency, people think that there is encryption involved. But since everybody is keeping the same ledger, it is publicly available to everybody. So there is no confidentiality involved. So there are no encryption algorithms involved. So not every blockchain requires high electricity consumption. This only depends on the consensus algorithm. So as I mentioned before, for instance, Ethereum in the future might not uh, require this much electricity consumption. Another misconception is that not every blockchain is permissionless due to this cryptocurrency technology, since everybody can became, become a miner, they can add blocks to the blockchain. But there, you can also have permission blockchains where you give permission to only some people who can add blocks, but everybody can read those blocks. I will give an example at the end of these slides. Another misconception is that cryptocurrencies and crypto assets are not sent or received. Only the ownership info is updated in the blockchain. So this is really important because when people uh, download a uh, software and have cryptocurrencies or NFTs or any other crypto assets in those wallets, they think that they're stored there. So it took a lot of time for me to explain this to forensics investigators. So whenever they have a laptop with some Bitcoin in it, they think that if they don't connect it to internet, it will stay there. Actually, nothing is stored there, so you cannot send or receive it. Actually, ownership of the cryptocurrencies or crypto assets are recorded in the blockchain. So those transactions actually only changes the ownership. So with your private key, you are actually uh, proving that that cryptocurrency has belonged to you. And by, again, uh, signing the transaction, you are actually transferring it to somebody else, saying that the new owner is now this person. So everything is stored in the blockchain, not in your computers. So this is why uh, here I'm saying that they are not stored in digital wallets. Digital wallets only store your private and public key so that you can change the ownership. This is really important. These are very important misconceptions. So in the title, I actually use almost every buzzword. So blockchain, NFT, Web3, Metaverse. Only missing thing was quantum. So here I wanted to mention quantum cryptography. So the security behind this uh, blockchain technology, the cryptographic algorithms are really secure. So people are wondering if there is a backdoor. So as far as we know, there is no easy way of uh, breaking these systems, but if somebody develops a large quantum computer, this would allow to solve uh, problems that uh, whose uh, actually uh, many cryptographic algorithms security depend on the hardness or intractability of some problems like elliptic or digital, sorry, elliptic or discrete logarithm problem or integer factorization problem and so on. So if somebody builds a quantum computer, a very large one, actually they can really uh, get all of the cryptocurrencies to themselves. But uh, current technology is a little bit far from this. IBM recently uh, announced that they have 127 qubits as, a, as their quantum computer. But to break the digital signature algorithms that are used in Bitcoin or similar technologies, one needs around 2,300 logical qubits. But these qubits are also noisy. So actually in real world, you might need 7 million physical qubits to you know, perform this attack. And this, that attack takes around 20 days and so on. So currently we are far from uh, having this in current technology, but in the future we might be uh, have problems. So this is why actually NIST organizing a post-quantum cryptographic competition. So we are actually developing digital signature algorithms that will be resistant to quantum computers. So that being said, uh, since the introduction of Bitcoin in 2008, blockchain technology created a massive hype. So yet after 14 years, we have seen only a few meaningful use cases like cryptocurrencies, financial applications, which are not cryptocurrencies, but actually connecting the real financial world, the banking system to the blockchain and so on. So these applications sometimes see 
more than 8 million transactions in a day. So I'm assuming that it really works. So there are many fintech companies. The third thing we have seen NFT, but this is very controversial. So I will actually mention one of the, a lot of, of the security issues in the following slides. But other than that, actually, we haven't seen any meaningful use case. So this is actually confusing because you're hearing the uh, word blockchain many times. There are many academic papers, but th those papers who actually develop uh, new solutions to problems like scalability and so on, they're actually correct. They have new results in zero knowledge proofs or uh, signature algorithms, but many academic papers propose that we can use a blockchain in such in a problem, but almost all of them are actually wrong or redundant. We haven't seen any other use cases which cannot be solved by other means. So most of these uh, papers where they propose to use a blockchain, actually you can see that they wouldn't work because in order for a blockchain to be useful, you have to answer all of the following questions as yes. A shared and consistent data store is needed. Data is contributed by more than one entity or auditing is required. Records are never updated or deleted after they are written. Sensitive data will not be stored as plain text. Control of the data store cannot be assigned to a single entity. Tamper-proof logo of all data store is wanted. So if you, in your problem, if all of these are the cases, then maybe a blockchain will be useful for you. This is why there, there was a huge hype. People said that blockchain is the biggest invention since the internet, but actually we don't see many applications. And this is why uh, everybody wants to use blockchain everywhere, but actually you don't need it most of the time. So this is why uh, you should be very careful and see if you really need a blockchain other than you know, cryptocurrencies and so on. So 10 years ago, I actually uh, gave an idea for a blockchain. So I will repeat it here because uh, 10 years ago, I was working at uh, Dean's office at Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And constantly I realized that there are some emails that weren't re answered by the uh, personnel because they didn't speak English. And I realized that we were receiving mails from universities uh, from uh, Europe or America saying that if the attached diploma is real or not. And almost all the time they were not real. So people are, you know, uh, applying to uh, positions using a fake diploma. So what I propose that let's have a blockchain and authorize Middle East Technical University uh, to uh, add transactions to this blockchain and all of the transactions will only include the you know, diploma information. So I don't really know my diploma number. So I gave a random number here. So if you write all of, your, all of the diploma information to a blockchain, since it will be uh, distributed, anybody can check if a proposed diploma is secure, uh, real or not. So if, other universities prefers to use the same strategy. They, we can give them an uh, authority so they can also uh, write their diplomas to the blockchain. So this way, this also applies for you know companies who give certificates, especially in the area of cybersecurity. There are many, many certificates. So if you write them on a blockchain, this way, we can easily see that most of the things people claim at LinkedIn are actually not correct, right? Because people uh, say lies in their CV. So this is one way of doing it. So of course, when I uh, announced this 10 years ago, there weren't privacy laws like GDPR in Europe or KVKK in Turkey. So writing this and publicly announcing it to everybody uh, will be against privacy laws. So what you can do is take the hash of this information, the result will be something like this. So only write this information to the blockchain. So whenever, for instance, if you apply for a job, you can just write, give this information. They will calculate the same hash value and realize that you, you really own that diploma. So one of the use cases that comes to my mind is this. But of course, if you 
can say that we can solve this problem with different technologies, then I will say, why not? But currently it looks like that we really need such a blockchain. So that being said, I'm moving on the NFTs. So NFTs are actually a special type of token. So let's talk about tokens. Tokens are digital assets built on top of the blockchain via specialized smart contracts. There are two types, fungible tokens, which are identical and interchangeable. Generally, ERC-20 standard is used. So these are most of the time used for fundraising or maybe introducing a second cryptocurrency on top of a blockchain that is actually a cryptocurrency. Or you can do something else. And in this case, we call it non-fungible tokens. This time, these are unique. And each token represents someone's ownership of a specific digital asset. And most of the time, they are created by ERC-721 standard. So an NFT is an ownership record stored on a blockchain. Digital items such as pictures and videos are the most common assets traded as NFTs. An NFT is equivalent of a conventional proof of purchase, such as paper invoice or an electronic receipt. So actually, the thing that you, when you buy an NFT, you people think that the image or the video is stored on the blockchain together with this receipt, right? But the thing is that actually only this uh, receipt is stored. So, and I will mention this in the next slide. The NFT concept allows for trading of digital assets between two mutually distrusting parties as both the cryptocurrency payment and the asset transfer happen atomically in a single transaction. So this is actually what we hear in the news and so on. So you can do this in a single transaction. If you use something, if your blockchain is Ethereum or something like Ethereum, but if you are using Bitcoin blockchain, this NFT purchase generally requires two transactions. In the one, you transfer the money. In the other one, you transfer the ownership of the NFT. So uh, ERC-721 is the most popular standard. And you might think that why this technology is good. This way, actually, digit, you can buy the work of digital artists and support them. This is why I actually like this uh, concept. But the thing is that uh, this most popular standard has some flaws. Uh, and it, this standard actually works like this. Each NFT has its own ID, token ID, to, to keep track of these unique tokens. And when an NFT is created, and the word is mint is used in this case, the creator can optionally associate a URL with the NFT. And that URL actually is the image or the video that you buy. That URL called metadata URL should point to a JSON file that conforms to the ERC-721 metadata JSON schema. So sorry, I'm correcting myself. That URL actually is the URL of the JSON file. In the JSON file, we have the image URL. And also in the JSON file, we have two more fields, the name and the description. So this actually causes some problems because NFT essentially connects an asset with the record of its ownership. But ERC-721 standard does not record the hash of the file. So you're actually trying to create a link between the receipt and the data itself. But the receipt actually does not contain the information that is unique to the uh, image itself. So uh, let me explain the problems and then I give some examples. So NFT images, videos are not stored in the blockchain. So most people does not know this. So they think that they are stored in the blockchain. And the problem, main problems arises from here. And also NFT is not copyright. Since there are no regulations, you, buying an NFT does not mean that you are actually getting the copyright to yourself. And most importantly, NFT files might may be lost or changed in the future. So people think that since uh, nothing in the blockchain can be modified, they think that when they buy an NFT, it will stay in the blockchain, so it will be secure forever. For instance, 200 years later, your NFTs will stay there. But the thing is not as like this, and I will try to explain with some pictures. So I love this example created by Moxie. So he created an NFT. He wrote the smart contract himself and put it into Ethereum blockchain. 
So if you go to OpenSea web page, Moxie's NFT looks like this. But if you go to another web page, the same NFT will appear like this. So question arises. So if you buy this, which one actually you are buying, right? So if you buy it, what will appear in your wallet? And actually, if you buy this NFT and look it in your wallet, like something like MetaMask, it will appear like this. So the trick here is that uh, Moxie actually keeps the NFT in an HTTP web page. And since this is just a server, when you are requesting an image from the server, by looking at your IP address, the server might give you a different image. So this may happen to all of the NFTs that are stored on a regular web page. Okay, they can be changed or they can actually be deleted. For instance, somebody buys the domain name in the future, they can change the picture or delete it. So these are the, and many very expensive NFTs are stored in this kind of HTTPs. So a workaround is to, uh, you know, keep these files in a more secure place, for instance, like a cloud or in a decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer file systems and IPFS is a solution for this, but it has also its own problems. So in order to test one of these things, I created a digital art like this and I created an NFT. So in the JSON file, it is stored as then IPFS. As you can see, there are some random values here, which I will explain later. So in the uh, JSON file, the mandatory parts name and description are here and the image also stored in an IPFS link. So uh, one thing that bothers me here is that as you can see, there are many slash ends. So actually when I press the new line and when I press my enter button, they store the data as an HTML code. So this, in the future, this might cause a problem. For instance, if in the future in a metaverse, if you have the NFT on the, wall of your virtual house. When somebody wants to see the description, they will see slash ends there because there's no standard saying that it will be an HTML text. And more importantly, if uh, marketplaces know that this is HTML and you know turns the slash ends into new lines, a new question arises, can I inject a malicious code here? If you, you know, write malicious HTML code here, I wonder what will happen. So this is a, a huge security issue from the perspective. So if you go to this link, so you will have the image. So this is the IPFS link. Actually from the image, uh, they divide it into pieces when you upload this to the system and each piece are stored by somebody else. And they keep those pieces for a long time, but if nobody downloads them, they actually delete it. So uh, when you upload such an, NFT image to IPFS, pieces or the whole picture might be lost in the future. In order to solve that problem, and this happened a lot, we realized that many NFTs are unreachable. So we contacted to some marketplaces, probably they re-uploaded it to the IPFS. So a few hours later, they became available. Uh, so this is why uh, even if you put it to a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer file system, your files can also get lost. And I complained that the hash of the file is not included in the standard. So some people think that if you put a files, the IPFS, we actually you know, provide integrity because this uh, number here, this random values here, actually includes a SHA-256 value like this. So some people argue that actually the integrity is provided, but the thing is that this hash value is different than the hash of the file, because most probably this is the hash of the Merkle tree or something, because the documentation is really bad. Actually, no, there are no documentation, but from the uh, code, you cannot understand what this hash value is in actually is. But the thing is that still your file might be lost. And if in the future, if it gets lost, you cannot claim that you own the file that has this hash value because it has never been included in the NFT. So let me briefly explain more issues and move on to the Web3. Currently, NFT marketplaces do not enforce know your customer rules. 
anti-money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism. These are actually enforced by uh, cryptocurrency exchange web pages, but NFT marketplaces do not enforce them. In the future, this might cause a problem. And second problem is that around 28% of the token contracts are closed source. We call them not verifiable. This means that the source code of these smart contracts are not available. Actually, you can go to the blockchain and read the bytecode, but it is very hard to understand from there. And since they are closed source, you actually don't know if the smart contract is implemented properly. So there are some, uh, this kind of closed source uh, smart contracts where you buy an NFT, but at the end, the NFT is not transferred to you. So this can happen. So between June and December 2021, OpenSea took down close to 2000 closed source tokens, which account more than $300 million. And Another problem is that this standard actually allows for the possibility to change a token's metadata. So recall that when you create the token, you assign a URL to it, which actually contains a JSON file. And in that JSON file, you have the image link. So if they're allowed to change the metadata, so they may change the URL and in the future, your NFT might change. So you might think that this shouldn't happen most of the time, but in a very recent paper, researchers observed, observed that more than 100,000 out of 3 million metadata URLs were changed in the six months. So this is a huge number. So the NFT is changed or it is mapped to another URL after you buy it. And so this is a some, as far as I know, only one marketplace doesn't allow to change this metadata information, but most of them allows it. Four out of 12 million NFTs on OpenSea are actually inaccessible because I told you that the files might be get, might get lost. It might be deleted or something. But since all of these marketplaces store the catch of the image, they show you that NFT as if it is accessible. So you can actually go and buy an NFT that is no longer stored in a file server. So another thing is that OpenSea and Rarible allow the creator to modify royalty after the sale. So NFT actually, you know, since it's, it can be resold, the original owner uh, receives some percentage of the money as the royalty fee. So for instance, if you buy an NFT, maybe that royalty fee is 5%. So when you resell it, the 5% of the price will go to the creator. But if since they are allowed to change it, maybe you bought an NFT, and you think that 5% of the next sale will go to the owner and you will receive the remaining around 90%. But the, if they change it to you know, something a very high value, you will earn a lot less. And again, in the same uh, paper, around 9% of OpenSea royalty bills were modified after the first sale. This is what academicians observed. So there are many, many issues as you can see. So it is very hard to use them in the future, but uh, they're planning to be used in, you know, in Web3 and Metaverse. So I'm starting from blockchain to show you that what can go wrong when we reach the Web3 and Metaverse. Before uh, completing the topic of NFTs, we, can, we need to talk non-transferable tokens. So these are NFTs, but they cannot be transferred. So think that, and they are created once, and transferred by the creator to the owner, and you cannot transfer it again. So these can be useful for awards and certificates or degrees. So if you go back to my uh, diploma blockchain example, instead of creating your own uh, blockchain, you can just create an a entity like here, for instance, and award it to the person who graduated it this year. So this way, if this idea you know, keeps up, everybody will have all of their degrees, all of their certificates to their, uh, uh, to their uh, wallets, let's say. So maybe in the future, uh, LinkedIn will allow you to log in with your wallet. So once you logged in, they can check all of your uh, awards and certificates and list them, which will be, you know, approved. So I gave the image like this, but if you, uh, you know, use in a pixelated way, you can even store this image on the blockchain itself because now the, you know, 
image size is smaller and so on. But if the image size is larger, so this is why you have to keep the image to, uh, at IPFS or someplace else so that there might be problems there. Okay, that being said, I'm moving on to Web3. So uh, current internet is called Web2. So generally we don't know, for instance, in Middle Ages, people don't know that they are living in the Middle Ages, right? But so uh, we are told that we are living in Web2 world. And this currently, this internet is dominated by companies that provide free services in exchange for your personal data. But as the saying goes, data is the new oil. This is why we are receiving free service, but you know, all our data is used by these companies. So Web3 refers to decentralized apps that run on the blockchain. And these are shortened as dApps, allow anyone to participate without monetizing their data. So advantages will be, you know, everything will be decentralized peer to peer. So no single point of, point of failure. You know, so if there's a problem with WhatsApp or Facebook, you know, you cannot have the service for hours in the decentralized system. We are expecting that nothing, that kind of thing will happen. And more importantly, users will own their data and content and users can monetize their data and content if they want. And uh, another advantage will be private key can replace every password because today we are trying to remember all of our passwords and so on. But with a, you know, a single wallet, you can you know, authorize yourself and log in and so on. So currently th there are a lot of you know, companies or projects, but some people divided into layers as follows. At the protocol layer, we have the blockchains. In the infrastructure layer, we have storages like IPFS here, as I mentioned, and use case layers like NFTs or gaming and so on. And the access layer, you use your wallet like MetaMask to use these services. And actually Web2 will also want to you know, use these services. So for instance, in the future, most probably when you want to add a picture to, or photo to Facebook, probably it will ask if you want to upload it or if you are going to use an NFT or something. So I think Twitter started doing this. So uh, let's go back to um, Moxie's NFT example. So I told you that this looked like this in different web pages. And due to this, uh, OpenSea actually removed this image from their web page. So it stays in the blockchain, but they decided to not to show it in their web page. So they removed this one. But strange thing happened because when they removed it, it also appeared from the MetaMask wallet. Since these are two different companies, it is very bizarre thing to happen, right? Because it is like, you know, blocking a Twitter in Turkey and all of a sudden, none of the people in the world can uh, visit the Twitter. This is something like that because the NFT is in the blockchain. So if some web page doesn't want to show it, it shouldn't affect the others. But it turns out that they are using the same libraries and APIs. So you are, they're actually looking at the blockchain from somebody else's glasses. So this actually destroys the idea of decentralization, right? If, you're, if somebody tells you what is in the blockchain, then this will cause a very huge problem in the future. So this is why uh, I'm saying that uh, uh, decentralization might be lost in the future because people do not like managing their own service. We always say that it is decentralized and so on, but nobody actually uh, you know, do it by themselves, right? They don't create their own service. This is actually why Web 1 failed and we moved to Web 2, because we, people got tired of you know, uh, having their servers on 24 hours and so on. And decentralized apps in the previous example I showed that can turn into centralized apps when they share the same libraries or APIs. And uh, considering that hundreds of cryptocurrencies died in the last 10 years, assuming that the blockchain will live forever might be a huge assumption. There might be some problems in the future and maybe that the blockchain will be lost. So these are the uh, Web3 challenges that comes to my mind. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I will uh, pass the talk about metaverse. So the metaverse refers to digital worlds in which people will gather to work, play and hang out 
where you can own digital assets like NFTs and transact using cryptocurrencies. So we are hoping that a company will create a metaverse. So what will happen is as follows, for instance, let me give an example like this. For instance, Ministry of Education uh, can move the education in Turkey, for instance, high school education to this metaverse. So they create a world there where students register to these uh, high schools there, but instead of their real appearances, they create an avatar. And this way, you know, uh, it solves some problems like bullying and so on. And uh, for instance, when a, a lesson or lecture starts, if the person stands up with their VR headset at their home, the, their avatar will not stand up because the teacher doesn't allow them to. Or when they talk to their microphone, they will be muted because again, the teacher didn't allow them to speak. So uh, from this, after the uh, school, the same kid can go to another world, for instance, the world where maybe somebody owns the copyright of the uh, Lord of the Rings. So you can go to Middle Earth with the same avatar and you know, you can get the sword and fight with monsters and get a ring of invisibility. And when you come back to your school, we want interoperability. So the ring of invisibility will be again on your avatar, but of course the magic will be disallowed in the school. So you wouldn't become invisible there. So that is the, uh, you know, the dream and the, and you buy NFTs, for instance, when you buy a, a shoe in the real world, probably they will assign an NFT of the same shoe. So with your avatar, you're going to wear it and so on. So there's a very nice book about this, uh, uh, read the player one, there's also a movie which actually uh, gave a voice to this dream. But the, here the main misconception is that metaverse does not exist yet. So we are hearing it on the news and so on all the time, but it does not exist yet. And there may be more than one metaverse in the future since uh, it will be profitable for companies to create such uh, universes. So having more than one metaverse will be having like parallel universes. So the main idea of interoperability might be lost in this case. And another misconception is that metaverse will not replace internet. Probably this misconception comes from uh, science fiction movies from 90s, but metaverse will use the internet infrastructure. And metaverse does not mean VR or AR because some people think that due to gaming, actually, since we are happy with the VR headset, the metaverse does not always mean VR because a person actually cannot wear the headsets the whole day, right? So some of the applications will be on the screens on our monitors anyway. So my main concern here is the main challenge is that software development takes too much time. So the example I gave you about you know, the uh, Ministry of Education and so on, to have such a metaverse, I think the earliest time will be like 15 or 20 years later. So don't expect a metaverse because now on the news, everybody are talking about this, but you cannot achieve it in a very short time. So this will be the main challenge. So probably in 10 years later, we will still be talking about what will be the metaverse be like. And the second challenge is the legal, legal system because it is not ready for metaverse. Uh, actually, it will be a very gray area and which, you know, country or the court will be responsible for the cases and so on. And it will be very hard to prove the crimes and so on. So there will be huge challenges in this part. And uh, another thing is the services that do not provide convenience will not be preferred because people saying that, you know, in the future we could get our VR headset and, you know, choose from the restaurants and order a pizza to our home, but you can do it in five seconds with your mobile phone. So those kinds of services will not be preferred in the first place. And some technologies emerge untimely and leave the scene, like the 3D TVs, you know, they were fantastic. We wanted to be, you know, in avatar all the time, but, you know, due to untimely uh, and some bad, uh, uh, commercialization, let's say, they died. So you cannot buy a 3D TV now. So the same thing might happen to made, might happen to Metaverse to maybe a few years later, we might stop talking about it and it may 
uh, reappear maybe 10 or 20 years later. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer.